So I'm Dove Levin. I'm the director. I'm the senior director for program management and education at the MGFA. Um, this is the Myasthenia Gravis Foundation Southwest Regional Conference. Our volunteers, Connie DePasqua from Southern California and Joan Monroe from Arizona have worked very hard to plan today's program. We have excellent speakers and I hope you enjoy the program today and that you learn something new. I'm gonna turn this over to Connie and Joan who will be our moderators for today's conference. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon and good day, wherever you are. Thank you very, very much for joining. We do have a, a full schedule today. Uh, in addition to that, we have international guests as well. Uh, we have multiple locations attending within the United States, as well as in the United Kingdom, France, South Korea, and Canada. And the beat goes on. And with that, we're gonna start with our housewarming or housekeeping, I wish it was housewarming, but our housekeeping rules. And that is just to let you know that because we do have a fairly large group, what we'd like, and we really do appreciate your consideration is to please keep yourselves on mute. In addition to that, because this is a virtual meeting and we're all on video, we get to see everything that everybody else is doing. So we certainly don't want to get caught drinking that beer while we're on our conference call. Okay, so if you kindly could during lunch or if you're snacking or if you have to do the laundry or anything like that, that you're multitasking, please just cover your video and make sure that you are blacked out. Okay, then when you return from your errand or your chore, just re-engage your video, all right? With that said, I'm going to turn the meeting over to Joan Monroe, who is my co-host. She has helped me along this path, putting this conference together. Thank you, Joan, very much, by the way. And uh, she will lead into our first guest speaker. Joan, I hand it over to you. Thank you, Connie. It's been great working with you and Dova as well. And it's really great to see all the familiar names and faces that we all know from our local groups, but also all over the US and as you said, all over the world. So with all that said, let's get started. Our first speaker is Dr. Todd Levine. Dr. Levine has been a specialist in neuromuscular disorders for over 20 years. He's the director of the neurology department at Honor Health in Scottsdale, Arizona. There are so many accomplishments that I'd like to acknowledge about Dr. Levine, but we do want to allow time for him to take some questions after he speaks. I do have to add though that I'm grateful that Dr. Levine is my neurologist. He's been working with me for over three years now. So thank you, Dr. Levine, for all you do for all your patients. And with that, I'll turn it over to you. Great, well, thank you. Uh, hopefully everybody can see my slides now, yes? Yes. Okay, all right, good, good, okay. I never know if that's gonna work. Uh, so, um, uh, Joan asked me to talk about uh, MG and COVID. Um, and when patients ask me this, which is now an everyday event in the clinic, uh, I usually just start by saying, well, we don't know anything. Um, so this could be a very short talk because obviously uh, this, is, this is a new disease. Um, this is uh, new for all of us. We're all learning as we go through. Um, but I thought instead of just taking the easy way out and saying, I don't know anything, um, that I would try to start with kind of some basic principles. Um, and, and these are pretty basic about medicine in general. And I think it really sort of helps us understand when people ask questions, um, if we uh, know what we're talking about in medicine. So again, I'm starting off with the idea that I'm not Anthony Fauci. Uh, I am not an infectious disease expert. Uh, I have treated MG patients for over uh, 25 years. Um, and so I'm definitely familiar with, with that disease. Um, so COVID-19 is really unprecedented, um, certainly in our lives, 
uh, people do go back to the, the pandemic in 1918. Um, so it's at least been a hundred years um, since the world has seen um, anything like this. Um, I think it's different in a lot of ways, even than the number of deaths that occurred back in 1918, because I think we felt that we were so advanced um, that, that a single disease, a single infectious agent couldn't stop the world's economy, the world's politics, the life, everything. Um, and so we, we realized that we were wrong about that. Um, as I said, we all are really learning as we go. And, and this was particularly true in the first six months of the pandemic when patients would come in on a Monday and I would say, okay, this is what we're doing now. And then on Tuesday, I would say, no, no, we're not doing that anymore. We're doing something different. And then by Friday, we'd be doing something different again. Um, so unfortunately, you know, it's been very frustrating for the world, for patients, for us as doctors. Um, and we are doing, you know, obviously the best that we can. I, I say to patients a lot, and you're going to hear me sort of explain this a little bit more in this talk, um, that, that in, in a lot of ways, when people come to see doctors, uh, they're coming to see doctors, uh, and uh, although they don't know it, they're really asking us to predict their future. Uh, and, and I tell people many times in a week, I don't predict your future any better than I predict my own future. So we don't have crystal balls. What we have is data uh, and scientific studies that allow us to say, if I do X, the percent that something good will happen is, is Y. The, per, the, the percent that something bad will happen is Z. And that's what we rely on. But when then you have something that's completely new, um, we don't have that data. Uh, and so we really are at a loss uh, in terms of being able to give very definitive answers. Um, the MGFA actually is working with a number of groups around the world uh, trying to get smarter. Um, they they um, publish uh, articles uh, routinely. Uh, they have databases and, and um, uh, as do other uh, neurology groups across the country, trying to collect data. We're all trying to collect data. Um, it, it's fascinating to me that within, I would say, two months of, of the pandemic starting, most of the journal articles um, that were being published across the United States, the New England Journal, the American Academy of Neurology Journals, uh, they were all about COVID. It was amazing how fast people were trying to adapt to this. Normally, if I get a paper published, it might take nine months before it's actually in print. Um, these journals were publishing things as fast as they possibly could, trying to educate us and educate the patients. So we are trying, but, but again, we are very limited with what we know. Uh, all right. Okay. So this is kind of, to me, a very important concept, um, which is Everything that we do in medicine is trying to balance the risk versus the benefit. Um, there is very few things and probably no things in medicine in which we can say the risk is zero and the benefit is that you will absolutely get better because people are too different. And what one person responds to in a positive way, another person may not respond to in a positive way. Patients with MG like to refer to themselves in some cases as snowflakes because everyone is different. And that is 100% true. It's true in the good way in terms of how you respond to a certain treatment or medication. It's true in a bad way in terms of the side effects that you're going to get from a, a certain treatment or medication. So let's think a little bit about that then when we think about myasthenia. So myasthenia gravis is called gravis because this was a very grave disease. Um, before the 1930s or 40s, when we didn't even have pyridostigmine, there was no treatment for myasthenia gravis. The descriptions of myasthenia gravis clearly go back at least un, un, until the Greeks. So it's been around for thousands of years. In the 16, 1700s, when doctors felt that patients had this condition and they started to get sick, weak, uh, what they would do is they'd simply put them in bed rest and they wouldn't let them move a single muscle and they would try to rest their muscles. Um, and that was really the only treatment that we had uh, until the early 20th century when we had pyridostigmine. During that period of time, the chance that you would die from myasthenia gravis was about 30%. So that's a pretty bad disease that had no treatment back then. The current death rate for myasthenia is 1%. So we've cut it by 3,000% if you're a statistician. So how did we do that? Well, we did that because we got medications. We started to understand the disease. We started to develop medicines to treat the disease. And we've really been able to make it unbelievably rare that a person ever dies from myasthenia anymore. But all of those medicines, as all of you know, 
come with a series of side effects with them. And so that everything that we do is trying to balance. Well, we know if we don't treat you with myasthenia, there's a good likelihood you're going to do badly. But you could look at that a different way and say, well, if I don't treat you with any medicines with myasthenia, there's a 70% chance you won't die. Oh, 70 is not bad, but the 30% chance that you do die is pretty bad. Um, and so that's why we know that we want to treat most patients with myasthenia. And when we talk about the COVID vaccine or any treatment, and not just for myasthenia, it's the same balancing act. It's doing the best that you can for you as an individual to balance the risk that we're giving you versus the benefit that we're giving you, knowing that every individual is different. So let's talk just a little bit, just kind of highlight this. Um, so probably uh, the most commonly used medication across the world uh, to treat myasthenia is prednisone. Prednisone is a steroid for whatever reason that we don't quite understand. Prednisone is an amazingly effective drug for myasthenia. Okay. Um, and it is, um, makes you stronger. It reduces the chance that you're going to go into a crisis. It's probably the cheapest medication out there that you could buy. Um, and it's a pill. So if you were trying to design a medication to say, let's think about the effectiveness of this medication, prednisone would be, un, would be probably your, your choice. Cheap, easy, and very, very effective. Okay. And that's why it's the most commonly used medication across the world. The problem is the second side of the slide, which is that prednisone has terrible side effects, right? So everyone gains weight on prednisone. There's a big risk that if you're on prednisone for too long, you get diabetes. Uh, particularly if you're a woman, the chance of osteoporosis is very high. Um, many patients end up needing cataract surgery. It can affect your stomach and cause peptic ulcer disease, frequently changes mood, always changes skin, more thin skin, bruising, those kinds of things, cause hypertension, and actually on and on. So we use prednisone all the time um, because of the left side of the column, but we're aware of the right side of the column. And what we have to do then is to try to monitor the patient and say, which side are they falling onto? And much of this does have to do with the dose of the prednisone. So low dose, if you do well, you're gonna be more on the left side. High, high dose, you're gonna be more on the right side. So think about that a little bit then as we now start to talk about COVID, okay? So what do we, why do we worry about COVID? Um, and why do we worry about COVID in MG? So COVID is caused by the SARS-CoV-2 um, virus. I think we all probably know that. What we know is that there are certain populations that are more susceptible to get COVID, but more importantly, they're more susceptible to get very sick from COVID. So we all know there are lots of people, young people in particular, um, they get COVID, they have sniffles for two days and they go home. I mean, they're fine. <laughs> um, and then people obviously die from COVID. Um, and so what makes those risks? Well, we do know that older age is a significant risk. Um, so my, both of my parents just had COVID in the last two months. Uh, they're uh, 90 years old, um, and they were very sick. Um, we also know that having other diseases, so hypertension, obesity, uh, diabetes, um, those conditions seem to increase uh, the risk of getting very sick from COVID. And then there's this question of what about immunosuppression? So what about people whose immune systems are not normal? Now, they may not be normal because they have a disease that's affecting their immune system or their immune systems may not be normal because us as doctors are giving them medications to change their immune system. We don't have the biggest set of data for that, but most doctors do believe that being immune suppressed also puts you at higher risk for having a worse case of COVID. Probably does not put you at any higher risk to get it, okay? Um, but the likelihood that you may get sick is actually um, significantly higher. Actually, just an article this morning, I meant to put it in the slides, but didn't have time, um, that was published, um, looked actually at patients in the hospital and asked the question, um, is it more or less likely that they're going to be discharged home or that they're going to die or go to a nursing home based on the presence of an underlying neurologic disease? And it turned out that having a neurologic disease, now they didn't specify which one, but having a neurologic disease just about tripled the likelihood that they would not go home and be independent. So clearly the conditions that people with MG face, right? So you have a neurologic disease. Many of you are taking medications that change your immune system. 
And myasthenia tends to be a little more common in people as they get older. So all of those risk factors means that COVID is something to be concerned about. And then the last point is that myasthenia can often affect the lungs. And because we know that people who die from COVID most often die from pulmonary problems, um, having a pre-existing pulmonary disease also puts you at risk. So there is good reason with, well, for everyone, obviously, but for people with myasthenia uh, to worry about COVID. Um, so let's also tend to take a look at what that means um, in, in a little bit more particular. So we know, for example, that patients with myasthenia who get the flu or get uh, the pneumonia, pneumococcal infections, um, are about 40% more likely to develop a serious infection than someone who doesn't have myasthenia. Um, we also know that if patients have any acute infection, so it doesn't have to be pulmonary, it could be a, a bad kidney infection or a sepsis from a surgery or something like that. Um, if you have one of those bad infections um, and you have myasthenia, that you're more likely to end up going on the ventilator um, than someone who doesn't have myasthenia. Um, we also uh, believe um, that people who have kind of an existing infection of any sort can trigger an exacerbation of their myasthenia. So this was a nice study that actually looked at 250 cases of patients that were having a myasthenia crisis, and they found that in half of those cases, there was some type of preceding infection. And that sort of makes sense to us because myasthenia is a disease that's caused by the immune system. And when you have sepsis or have an infection or have a pneumonia, we are, the, the body is clearly having to respond to that, which is then changing their immune system. And so it makes sense that those types of things could be triggers again for MG. Um, there's also a question which is, could COVID cause myasthenia? So we know that there are a number of infectious agents that seem to be triggers for certain neuromuscular diseases. The most common of those is Guillain-Barre syndrome in which many people will have some type of preceding infection. It could be an upper respiratory infection. It could be a GI like diarrhea infection, um, but then they get this very bad nerve disease in which they're often um, paralyzed. We have seen cases with COVID and Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is not surprising because again, it's similar to the other types of infectious agents that we've known to cause that. We've seen cases of patients that get COVID that develop a muscle disease, a myositis. So, so we know it causes nerve problems. We know it can cause muscle problems. Myasthenia is right in the middle, right? So that's the neuromuscular junction. There are a couple of rare reports of COVID seeming to trigger um, myasthenia. Again, whether it really caused the myasthenia or the person may have had a little subclinical myasthenia and then the infection just caused the worsening like we just talked about, it's not quite clear but we have seen that again in people that get the flu, the typical flu before. We've seen it in people that get shingles where the myasthenia wasn't clear, but now it comes out. So probably these are cases where uh, the acute infection is just unmasking their myasthenia, but we're not clear because we do also believe some infections can cause some neuromuscular diseases. So what about the medications and COVID and infections? So. Um, this, this is where life gets a little bit complicated and where we need to come back to this risk and benefit. Um, so we do know that there are certain medications that we give to people with myasthenia. Um, so steroids, uh, Celsept, rituximab, methotrexate, azathioprine, that clearly increase the risk of all infections. So people who take these medications are weakening their immune system. Therefore, a little bacteria that gets into the throat may cause an infection that wouldn't in a healthy person. A little bladder infection can become a kidney infection. So we do worry, and, and I think most, if not all doctors will say, when we put you on these medications, you are at increased risk of all infections. And again, it's about a 19%, which isn't huge. I mean, surprisingly, it's not as much as we would think, but there is still an increased risk from taking these medications. So what we have to do then is to try to assess the risk. And I love this slide um, because I uh, took care of a woman for about 25 years. I saw her every three months with MG and uh, she uh, passed away in her nineties. Um, but every time I saw her for 25 years at every three months, she would say, I'm damned if I do and I'm damned if I don't. And I was like, yeah, but you're also 95. So. <laughs> um, 
but but these are real issues, right? So we we know that MG um, is kind of a risk factor where if you get an infection, um, the chance that that's going to become a more serious infection is higher because you're taking um, these medications. On the other hand, if you don't take the medications, your MG is going to be worse and you may die again, going back to the 1900s where you have a 30% chance of dying. So there is not a perfect answer. I think that is one of the reasons that there are many new companies and new drugs in development for MG, because what we want is a medication that's going to work really well for MG without all of these risks that, that the older medicines expose people to. At the moment, we don't have that. So let's also ask the question, and just to sort of put this one to rest, hopefully, which is, do the vaccines work? Um, the answer is yes, they clearly work. Again, nothing works 100% of the time. But if you look at um, the purple slide here, this is the, the risk of getting um, COVID uh, in the people who got placebo, meaning they got the immunization, but there was nothing in the immunization. And then this was with the Moderna vaccine. You can see the risk is drastically reduced uh, by taking the vaccine. So um, what we believe is that it, it doesn't completely eliminate. You can see there is still some small chance that the people do get COVID. Um, but it almost entirely eliminates the risk of death or severe hospitalization. So even if you get the vaccine and even if you do get COVID, it's going to be a very mild, you know, upper respiratory infection type illness. It's not going to be the severe illness. So again, we now have three vaccines. There are more vaccines coming, but I think it's, it's pretty well established, even though, again, I'm not Anthony Fauci, uh, that the, the vaccines do work uh, for what they're supposed to. And again, this really is no different than what we've done with the flu vaccine, right? The flu vaccine never completely prevented the flu. Um, some people would get the flu vaccine and they'd still get the flu with like a few days of feeling sick, but they wouldn't be in the hospital and they wouldn't die from the flu. So is the vaccine effective though in patients with myasthenia? Um, and so um, the, these two points, the first point is if you have myasthenia, but you are not taking any medications that change your immune system, there is no reason to believe that your uh, side effects, ability to respond um, uh, to the vaccine is any different than anyone else. So the disease itself um, does not seem to affect the, the, the vaccine. Um, now, in patients who have myasthenia who are on immunosuppressive medications, here we just have less data. Uh, we just don't really know. And so there's not what I would say a very strong uh, consensus opinion as to what to do. So this is sort of how I think about things. There are certain medications that people take with myasthenia, which again, I would put on the left side of the slide, and I would say are highly unlikely to affect the vaccine, either side effects to the vaccine or the vaccine responsiveness. So IVIG is one of those. In fact, in many places, um, people might use IVIG if you get COVID. So there's no real reason to believe that being on IVIG should affect your ability to get the vaccine, side effects of the vaccine, or effectiveness of the vaccine. Mestinon, I threw in there just to make the point, Mestinon does not change your immune system. So again, if, if you're on Mestinon, that's perfectly safe. I can say you tell that 100%. Plasmapheresis is a treatment that some people with myasthenia get where we remove their antibodies um, to lower the, the bad antibodies in myasthenia that should have no bearing on your ability to get the vaccine or respond to the vaccine. Now, the next two, I'd say there's a little question mark next to. So the, um, I think the MGFA, the American Academy of Virology, have drawn sort of an artificial line. And they said, if you're on less than 20 milligrams of prednisone, there is very little data to believe that that can really change your immune system in any meaningful way as it relates to the vaccine. And therefore, we think it has no bearing. And then the last is uh, eculizumab or Solaris, um, which again, really shouldn't have any bearing on the uh, response to the vaccine. So those I consider less likely to affect. On the right side are the ones, again, many of you are on that may have some effect on the vaccine effectiveness. So it won't have any effect on side effects. So it's still safe to get the vaccine. But when you get a vaccine, your body has to mount an immune response in order to protect yourself, to get that good response that I showed you on that previous slide. So when we give you medications that weaken the immune system, now you can't mount that response and therefore you may not respond as well. 
Um, so these drugs, particularly depending on the dose, can have a significant impact. Of those, rituximab probably the most because rituximab kills a type of cell called a B cell. And the B cell is what allows you to respond to new triggers, new infections, new vaccines. And we've seen in the past that people who get rituximab would not respond to things like the flu vaccine or the shingles vaccine. So in that case, again, it won't cause any additional side effects, but you may not be as protected uh, if you take those medications and get the vaccine as someone who doesn't take those medications. So uh, the AANEM came out with a series of recommendations. I, I believe in these as well. So the first is any patient with MG who is not on an immunosuppressive medication should be encouraged to take the COVID vaccine. Again, it's all individual choice, right? So it's all individual risk versus benefit. So we're not saying you have to take the vaccine. We're just saying that we encourage you to take the vaccine because we think the risk is less than the benefit, but everybody gets to make their own decision. Patients who take immunosuppressive medications with MG need to really talk with their doctor and kind of weigh these things. But in general, my belief is, even if it's not quite as protective, because you're on rituximab, let's say, um, there probably is still reason to believe that the benefit outweighs the risk. And I would still encourage my patients to get that. And the point being that even if it's not quite as protective, it's still gonna have partial protection. And that partial protection would hopefully prevent the serious illness and death. Um, just to go over a bit about um, what happens if you do get COVID. Um, so this is sort of just some very take home, you know, simple take home points, which is number one, don't go out, <laughs> um, you know, stay home. Most people do fine. Um, so if you go get tested, you're positive, you're gonna quarantine yourself usually for about 10 days. Hydration is really important. Um, and then you do really want to try to stay away from your family members. So, um, you know, using other bathrooms and, and those kinds of things is, is very important. Um, if you do get hospitalized with COVID, um, there, a lot of people will ask questions about, well, what can I take uh, to help with the COVID, particularly if I have myasthenia? So the good news here is that we do have um, medications now that we think help prevent COVID from becoming severe. And the short message here is that none of these really have any contraindication if you have MG. So remdesivir is an antiviral medication. Um, it's approved by the FDA now uh, to treat people with COVID. It's given, I think, for five days in the hospital. Um, steroids, so dexamethasone is another type of steroid-like prednisone. Um, it's particularly only used if you need oxygen. So if you've got bad COVID, but you're not requiring oxygen, meaning your lungs aren't that involved, we don't use the dexamethasone. But once the lungs do become involved, then we use the dexamethasone and that sometimes could be for a couple of weeks. If you're on prednisone already, um, it's an interesting question, which is, do we still give the dexamethasone? I think the answer is yes. Again, we don't have any data to know if the dexamethasone works in people already on prednisone, but I think in most cases, we go ahead and give that anyway. Uh, the third is um, convalescent plasma. So people that donate uh, the IV, the plasma to become IVIG, um, we've been tracking these people and particularly asking people who've had COVID to donate plasma. And the idea being that they have antibodies in their blood uh, that will help protect from the, the COVID because they've already been, uh, it's almost like they're immunized against it and we're getting their own immunity. Um, that is a little tougher to get, but that can be given in hospitals as well. Um, and there is some other antibody cocktails um, that are used. These are used now just in what's called an emergency use scenarios. Um, so they're not approved by the FDA, but most hospitals can access them if they feel like the patients need them. Um, and all of these are safe uh, for people with myasthenia. Um, just to mention some disproven therapies, and you guys can throw tomatoes at me if you want. Uh, <laughs> but, um, I, I actually did go online to look at the number of different therapies that I could just Google in about 10 minutes um, to take. Um, and I found over 50 um, that ranged from plant products, cinnamon, um, on and on and on and on. Um, just to make a few kind of the ones that got the most press, um, hydroxychloroquine or Plaquenil uh, has now been proven not to be effective. Um, azithromycin has been proven not to be effective. Um, some people talked about radiation, extreme temperatures, um, you know, astringent uh, 
cleansers, um, none of those things have been proven to be effective. So uh, in essence, these are the only four things that we recommend taking. So again, I think all, all we can do as doctors is sort of give people the, the best data that we have. And, and I think hopefully everybody understands, but the data that I give you today may be very different than the data we have in six months. That's just the speed with which this has changed in the last 15, 16 months has been um, un unbelievable. Um, but again, I think what we've been doing with myasthenia uh, for almost a hundred years now, since pritostigmine was developed, was trying to balance um, ways that we can make people better um, and while still trying to limit um, the side effects. So hopefully as you think about the medications you might wanna take if you got sick, unfortunately, or whether you want to take the vaccine, trying to keep that in mind, I think is the most helpful. So I will stop there and I can take questions, Joan. Wow, thank you, Dr. Levine. That was amazing. Um, I think you answered some of the questions that we <laughs> for us. So I'm, I'm gonna go through them in uh, a logical order here. And if you've already answered them, we can move through quickly. Um, the first one I've got is from someone named John. He's saying, I have two questions. I've heard there are some COVID vaccine test trials for MG patients being run now. If this information is correct, are there any results in yet? Do you know about that? I'm not aware of any trials. Um, what there are are registries. Um, and so um, right now, again, the current medical belief obviously is that we vaccinate everyone that we can that wants to be vaccinated. So there wouldn't be a way to do a trial in that way, but there is um, there are registries where they're asking if you have MG and you do get the vaccine or don't get the vaccine to try to register and then they will just follow along with time. Um, I think there's a link on the MGFA website to those. Um, and uh, you, you could certainly enroll in that, but it would just be to kind of follow you, what we call the natural history, whether you get the vaccine or not. Okay, great, thank you. Um, the second part of his question is, he says, I've received my two COVID vaccine doses. A friend recommended that it would be a good idea to get an antibody test after the second dose. Do any of the MG specialist doctors recommend having this test done? And if so, how much time should pass before we get the test? So, yeah, I almost talked about that in my talk, but I thought it was too complicated, but uh, now I wish I had a slide. So uh, as you've heard, probably the vaccines are, uh, the current vaccines are mRNA vaccines. So what we're injecting into me and into other people is a little bit of the, the RNA molecule that becomes infectious. Um, it's not the actual uh, uh, virus, viral particle. The tests that we have available for antibodies for COVID are to the viral particle. So um, they're very helpful to say, have you ever been infected with COVID? But the current antibody tests cannot detect whether you've made an immune response to the vaccine they are working to develop that and it will be very important. So where this is important, for example, is if you take your, if you're on immunosuppressive medications and then you take the vaccine, you do have a risk that you may not be as protected. And so it would be really nice to know, did that vaccine work in you? But right now we can't do that because that test isn't available. It's not commercially available yet. So the hope would be in six months or so, we might have the ability to know that. The reason that that also is important, not just for, for you all with MG, is that um, we don't know how long the vaccine immunity will last yet, right? So we don't know, is it like the flu where you got to get it every year or you know, two or every five? So they've got to get that test available so that we can start to follow people and know when to do it. So at the moment, there's no reason to do the antibody test unless you're asking the question, did I ever have COVID? the antibody test that you'd get today won't tell you whether you responded to the vaccine. Okay, great, thank you. Um, we've got one here from somebody named Connie and she's saying in your practice, how many myasthenia patients have received the COVID vaccine and did they have any serious side effects? You know, I, honestly, I don't know. I have, I have a lot of MG patients and I, I know, um, I would say the majority of the patients over 75 have gotten the vaccine. And I haven't heard of anyone really having side effects. I mean, the most, you know, again, I had the vaccine. So 
you know, the most common side effect is that your arm is sore for a day or two. And it was pretty sore. <laughs> um, so that, that's real. Um, I've had a few people with, uh, I don't think with MG truthfully, but with kind of other neuromuscular diseases that tell me they have two or three days where their muscles and nerves just feel a little weird, like the more tingly, achy, flu-likey kind of stuff. Um, but then it goes away on its own in, in two to three days. So that's really all I've heard. I've, I've not, I'm sure I've had hundreds and hundreds of my patients in general get the vaccine. I've not heard of any bad side effects. Well, I'm one that had it based on your advice. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I had a little bit of a sore arm and I felt a little a little weak for maybe a day or two. Yeah, I just yeah. kept up with the Mestinon and I was fine by the next morning. So yeah. I, I didn't think it was a big deal. That's my personal experience. Um, so our next question is, are there any specific vaccines that are not as good for MG patients? We don't know. I think, um, you know, since the, um, the, the latest vaccine came out, which was the single dose, I think most people are like, oh, I want the single dose. Um, so I had a patient email me today and tell me, ask me where they could get that one. Um, I think the challenge, truthfully, is that um, there's just still a shortage of the vaccines. And so usually wherever you're getting the vaccine, they're getting one. It's not like they have all three. Um, but I don't think there's any reason to believe that any of the three vaccines would be of higher risk uh, to, uh, you know, to MG patients or anyone. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Next question is, is timing on when to get the vaccine between treatments such as IVIG that you get monthly or bi-weekly? That's a great question. So, um, uh, so I'll start with rituximab. Um, so rituximab uh, for most people with MG is dosed every six months. And again, because we worry that there may not be as much effectiveness when you don't have B cells and the B cells are just starting to come back at the end of the six months in between the infusions. So for rituximab, I do tell people the best thing is really just before your next dose. And, and on occasion, even kind of like, cause if you have to wait a few weeks in between vaccines, even if that means pushing the rituximab back a few weeks, that probably is maximizing the time when you're more likely to respond. Now you still won't have normal B cells, even six, seven or eight months after rituximab. So, but it just feels to me like there's a higher likelihood that it might work. Pretty much with everything else, I think there's no, uh, there's no reason to worry about it at all. Um, I've had patients and even nurses, you know, infusion nurses ask me, should they get the vaccine on the same day they get their IVIG? I don't think it matters. Now, if, if you get a lot of side effects to your IVIG, you know, where you've got the same two or three days of feeling kind of poopy after your infusion, it probably makes sense to wait a few extra days till you're not feeling bad before you do something else that may make you feel a little bad for a couple of days. But from a safety standpoint, I don't think there's any reason to, to worry. Okay, that's good to know. Um, next question, if the vaccine duplicates our DNA or our cells, I don't know which, I heard this from a family member nurse who read about it. Can you clarify that? Uh, so yeah, the, the idea is the way the virus infects the cells is sort of the, the simple way to think about it is it's injecting its RNA into your cells. And so what we're doing with the vaccine is blocking the ability for that virus to infect the other cells. Okay, that's why it's, a, it's an RNA vaccine because we're blocking that RNA. Doesn't, the vaccine doesn't affect our cells in any way that we, you know, that we know of um, because it's just targeted to that one um, specific molecule that we're trying to block. So it's, think about it as, because again, if, you, if, if I'm next to somebody uh, and I've gotten my COVID vaccine and that person sneezes in my face, I'm still gonna inhale the viral particles but those viral particles then have to try to infect my cells. And since I have antibodies in my blood now from getting the vaccine, those antibodies are gonna block those viral particles ability to get into my cells. So we can never prevent you from being exposed to COVID. We just have to prevent COVID's ability to get into your cells. That, that makes sense? 
Yes, it does. Yeah. And that kind of leads into the next question. Are we correct in telling people in our immediate circle that we are more susceptible to contracting COVID if they are not vaccinated, even if we are vaccinated? Uh, wait, so, so are we as an MG person more susceptible if they're not vaccinated, but we as the MG person are? Is that the question? Correct. Um, I don't, that's a good question. I don't think so. So, I mean, the, the idea would be that once you're vaccinated, um, and, and in my example, I just gave, if somebody, you know, exposed me to COVID and I've been vaccinated already, um, I just, the COVID wouldn't be able to make me sick because the COVID wouldn't be able to get into my cells. That would be true if you have myasthenia or not. Um, so, uh, as long as you have those protective antibodies from the vaccine, the hope would be that even if you're exposed to it, that, uh, you wouldn't get sick. Now, again, the vaccines don't prevent you from getting sick at all. So some people do have a mild illness. It's just that the, now that they've been vaccinated, it doesn't become a severe illness. Right. Um, so I think, I think that's the answer to the question. The other, um, the other question I thought maybe was asking is, uh, if you haven't had the vaccine, but you have MG, are you more likely to get COVID? And I think the answer to that is no, you're not any more likely to get it. But if you're on the immunosuppressive medications, you may be more likely to get sick or sicker if you do get it. Thank you. And I, I think maybe this person, uh, they're saying, should they be careful if they are around people that are not vaccinated, even if the patient herself is vaccinated? Yeah, that's a great, um, that's a good question. So pr probably the answer is yes. <laughs> um, you know, one of the things I've learned from the last 16 months is that I don't think any of us washed our hands and took the precautions that we should have you know, before November of 19. <laughs> um, so I think all of that is really important. I think if you're someone who's on immunosuppressive medications, that stuff is really being protective like that is very, very important. And remember, there's a lot of other terrible viruses out there and infections out there, not just COVID. So, you know, being cautious about all of those things, if you're on these types of medications that weaken the immune system would be really, really important. Thank you. Um, the next question is, are there measures that can be taken to reduce the risk of an exacerbation from vaccine side effects? Not that we know of. Um, again, I think you're, you're, Joan, you're, you know, you're a really great example, which is that I've had some people call me, you know, the day after the vaccine and say, I'm feeling a little bit worse. Um, and I usually say, let's wait 48 hours before we do anything, and, and then you're back to baseline. So again, I, I, you know, I've known plenty of people who don't have MG that feel achy or flu-like for a day or two, just like with the flu vaccine or other vaccines. So um, I, I have not seen anyone yet that truly had an exacerbation from the vaccine. It's a little bit similar. Uh, I know I'm, sometimes I'm, I offer a different opinion than, than your, all, all of your neurologists, but um, when you go onto the MGFA website, there's this giant list of medications that it says, never take, never take, never take. And um, I generally don't believe that um, because what I find is if you need those medications for a reason, even if it makes the myasthenia a little worse, we can always treat the myasthenia, right? So if you need, I mean, if you had to have an antibiotic, which is a you know, bad choice for myasthenic, well, you got to treat that infection. I'll worry about the myasthenia. I can fix that. I sort of feel the same way with the flu vaccine or the COVID vaccine, which is, I believe everybody needs the COVID vaccine to be safe. Um, if the myasthenia gets a little worse, I'll treat that. So far, I haven't seen it, but I'm completely confident I could treat it if it got a little worse, whereas I'm not confident. I mean, there's no treatment for COVID really, right? So if you get bad COVID and die, no one can treat that. But I know if the myasthenia gets a little worse, I can always treat that. So the, oh, yeah. that's great. That answered that question, I'm sure. Um, next one, do you see a difference? Oh, now we're kind of off COVID a little bit. <laughs> do, you, do you see a difference between generic and non-generic mestinon and prednisone? Uh, so th 
the, the scientific answer is that um, as a generic medication, so if there's 20 milligrams of prednisone, as a generic medication, you have to be within 10% of that, which means that it could be 19 or it could be 21. And it could be 19 because you get the, the drugs in March and it could be 21 because you get a different one in April. Um, that's the variability that the FDA allows in, in uh, generic medications. So if that little bit of difference, 10% difference um, changes you know, the, the responsiveness to your disease, we, we can see a difference sometimes. Um, generally in prednisone, that 10% is not enough to really see a difference. And, and I think everybody's on generic prednisone, truthfully. So um, I, I don't worry about it much with prednisone. I will say that with mestinon, um, I've had enough patients over the years, I mean, it's not a small number, um, that have tried to go to generic mestinon and they just say it's not as good. Um, and they want to go back to the branded one. And I, I believe them. And then I just, you know, sometimes they may have to pay a little more. Um, but most of the medications in MG, I, I don't see a big difference. Where we see a big difference, this is off topic, but um, is in the medications that we use to treat seizures. Because there, the difference, that 10% that difference in the level of the seizure medication can make a very big difference for someone. But at MG, I don't see it too often. But I said mestinon is the one of, the, of all the drugs, mestinon is the one where I've heard it enough over the years that I think for some people it does make a little difference. Great, thank you. Um, here's another good one. What are the signs that mean I'm going from a flare into a crisis? <laughs> um, so we basically use the word crisis to mean trouble um, swallowing or breathing. Um, and, and so that would be sort of a, a, we call a class five. So if, if someone was having, if you're having shortness of breath, really having trouble swallowing, a lot of times you can't handle your secretions, you're kind of drooling or you can't eat, that's a crisis. And, and that a hundred percent of the time needs to be in the hospital. Um, so um, the, the rest of it, you know, again, we try to manage and keep people out of the hospitals, particularly these days. Um, and it's just sort of a sense of kind of, what the, what the course is. So in other words, if, if I'm having a little more trouble getting up out of a chair today, but you know, then in a week I can't get up out of a chair. And then in another week, now I can't get my arms up over my head. And it's clear that things are going worse, worse, worse. We'd probably kind of call that a crisis, but, but technically it's um, trouble swallowing or breathing to be a crisis. Okay, great, thank you. Um, next question, if you were diagnosed with myasthenia, and never had symptoms, can the vaccine trigger symptoms? Hmm. <laughs> um, well, so the first question would be, how did you get diagnosed if you didn't have the symptom? It does occasionally happen, right? So we believe, um, uh, this is my typical MG talk uh, stuff, but um, of all the autoimmune diseases that exist in medicine, and there are, I'm sure, hundreds, if not more than hundreds, um, myasthenia is, is relatively unique in that we know the antibody causes the disease. So for example, there are antibodies in people with lupus, but if I take the blood of a lupus patient and I give it to me, I don't get lupus. There are antibodies in the blood of people with multiple sclerosis, but if I take their blood and give it to me, I don't get multiple sclerosis. If I took your blood with myasthenia and I gave it to me, I would get myasthenia because the antibodies absolutely cause the disease. It's the one, it's only, it only needs one thing to cause the disease. So rarely we'll have people that, you know, get the blood test checked and it's positive um, and they don't really have any symptoms. It's pretty rare, but that, that can happen. And then, and then the, I suppose a vaccine could kind of trigger it. I mean, so that, that could happen, but it'd be pretty unusual. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, this is a really good question. Um, are specific types of myasthenia more susceptible or harder to treat, like comparing musk, LRP4, seronegative? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, so this, it's a good question. Um, we generally think that musk may be a little bit harder to treat than antibody positive. Um, and the number of drugs that work for musk myasthenia are many fewer than work for antibody positive patients. So that's, that's definitely one difference. Um, 
the LRP4 can sometimes be a little bit more challenging um, to treat, but there's it's it's relatively rare, so we don't see many of those. Um, and then the antibody the antibody negative ones are a real challenge, um, and 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 can and say can kind of go either way. So I, I would say antibody negative and antibody positive probably respond about the same, and musk probably a little less well. You know? Okay, great. Um, here's another one. Um, this lady had COVID last uh, December, early January. Um, she's having a lot of problems since then. She's very concerned now. Uh, I'm not going to go into all the details, but um, she's concerned about getting the second vaccine. So do you have any advice for her? She had the COVID vaccine back then or she had COVID back then? She had COVID, um, I'm sorry, um, late December, early January, hospitalized. She got convalescent plasma mm -hmm. 60 days ago. And then she got just got the vaccine, but she had a lot of reactions to it. Now she's worried about getting the second vaccine. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't, I don't know that I know the answer to that. So we we are vaccinating people who have been infected um, because again, we just don't know how long the immunity lasts and, and we're trying to sort of stretch that out. Um, I mean, I, number one, I'd certainly talk to your doctor, maybe talk to infectious disease doctor, um, but here you'd have to, I mean, it's a good, it's a hard question because you'd have to balance the risk and the benefit, right? So you're already gonna get some immunity from the infection you're going to get some immunity from the first vaccine. And then for yourself, you'd have to decide, is it really worth the risk of feeling bad again from the second vaccine? I, I don't, I don't know the right answer to that one, but yeah, you'd have to check and see. Sure. That's a quite a personal question. Yeah. There. yeah, yeah. Um, regarding seronegative, how are, how are treatments different in that area than someone who actually has Musk or LRP4? So the seronegative people, so if we're convinced that somebody has myasthenia, so they're, even though their antibodies are normal, they, um, you know, have an abnormal EMG or what we call an abnormal single fiber EMG, um, those patients typically respond the same way that antibody positive people do. So mestinon, prednisone, IVIG, and then all the other uh, host of drugs. The, the new drugs like eculizumab um, and some of the other newer drugs that are coming out, um, those have only been tested in uh, antibody positive. And therefore, when we go to insurance companies, this is a, a big frustration for me. Uh, if I have an antibody negative patient who's failed three, four, five therapies, and I wanna kind of go to these new expensive therapies, um, I usually cannot get them approved because the FDA indication is for antibody positive. So that's the biggest difference really, is that unfortunately the newer drugs are uh, understandably not testing the antibody negative and therefore it becomes very difficult to use them. Yeah, the insurance is always the problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> here's, here's a great, great question. Uh, since we can transfer MG if we share blood antibodies, can we still be an organ donor after death? Hmm. I think the answer is yes, but I'm not 100% sure. Uh, so, you know, they, they flush it out and it's not, it's not a protein that's on the cells, um, which is what you worry about with like matching organs. Um, so I, I think the answer is yes, but that's a good question. Maybe somebody from the MGFA can answer that one later. <laughs> Great. Um, one other question. Oh, Connie, did you I, have some? I just want to alert everyone that we are five minutes to the top of the hour. So we can take a, maybe a few more questions. Um, I see they are coming in quite frequently. Yeah. Um, we will probably not be able to answer all of them at this time. So I'm going to turn it back over to Joan, but give everybody a heads up. We're at, almost at the top of the hour. Okay, thank you, Connie. Thank you for the reminder. It's easy to get carried away here with all this <laughs> information. Um, I, oh, this is a good one. Um, double vision, um, are the symptoms of this hard to treat? What are your thoughts on it? What can a patient do to help alleviate that? 
So uh, obviously that's a very common symptom in myasthenia. And the, and the reason for the double vision is that when we, when we look at something, uh, the two eyes have to be able to focus that image in exactly the same place in their retina, in the back of their eye. And so if your eye muscles are a little weak in terms of how you fixate your eye on that image, then it's gonna be in two different places on the retina and your brain's gonna see that as two different images. Okay, so that's, that's the reason. Um, obviously we hope that that gets better with treating the MG. Um, there are people that have purely ocular myasthenia, meaning it only affects their eyes and none of their other muscles. And then it can be a part of the more generalized myasthenia. Um, so number one, we hope it gets better with treatment of the MG. There are some people, um, not a, not a large percent, but there are definitely some people where I can treat their MG and just get everything perfect. Like they look perfect, perfect, yet their eyes just never quite make it back. Their eyes always sort of have um, that double vision. We usually recommend um, obviously being evaluated by the eye doctors and then they'll get prisms put in. Now the, the trick to prisms, and so what prisms are gonna do is gonna bend the images so they can kind of bring it back in line. So you see everything in the same place in both retinas. The problem in myasthenia is that very often a person's symptoms fluctuate throughout the day, right? I mean, most, that's kind of the, the nature of myasthenia is you're kind of good in the morning and then you're a little worse, and then you rest and a little worse. And, and so if you're wearing glasses that have prisms and your eyes are changing throughout the day, the prisms will not work for you. And in fact, they can make you worse mm -hmm. because it'll, it'll be bending the images all over the place. But some people end up with just kind of fixed weakness in their eye muscles and then prisms can help. Um, it sounds a little funny, but actually if, if the double vision is bad um, and you're kind of early in the disease course, and so you're just gonna take some time to get the eyes better, the simplest thing is alternating patching, eye patches. Mm -hmm. So again, you can't have double vision with one eye. You can only have double vision with two eyes because you have to see two images. So if you close one eye, you're fine, but you just wanna be able to alternate the patch. And so many people will do that while we're waiting for them to get better. And then, in long-term cases, if there really is just no improvement, it's not done very often, but the, in, in myasthenia, the eye doctors can go in and they can just help kind of tighten the muscles up a little bit. So they do a little eye surgery. Again, it's hard if the muscles are different throughout the day, but if you're just absolutely the same, um, then sometimes that can help. Great, thank you. Well, I think we have time for one more here. Um, this, is, uh, this is a really good one. When will they start testing the newer meds on antibody negative patients? <laughs> discriminatory not to allow zero negative patients the same treatments because of the cost. Yeah, uh, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, so one, uh, from a scientific standpoint, when you do a study, you wanna make sure that everybody who is in the study is really exactly the same. They have exactly the same disease, exactly the same pathology. So in antibody positive myasthenia, that's really easy because you take the blood test. And if they have the antibodies, they have the antibodies. Antibody negative myasthenia could be coming from many different things. We don't know that it's even one disease, right? And so until we sort of start to understand the nature of that, um, then I think it's a lot harder to do those studies. So. That's the, kind of the scientific question. The political insurance, medical economic question is if the doctor is convinced it's antibody negative, um, you know, why can't we use the same drugs? I had a patient about a year and a half ago who was antibody negative, And for whatever reason, his insurance approved the eculizumab and he got unbelievably better. I mean, within eight weeks, he was incredibly better. And then the end of the year came, he changed jobs, changed insurance, and his new insurance wouldn't let him have it, even though we had already proven that it was like an incredible responder to the drug. So some of it, I think, is just we got to get the political pressure to say, you know, we're not, we don't want to throw these expensive medications at everyone, but, you know, a lot of these are, are really worth a trial for people. And it is a shame that we can't, you know. Yes, definitely. 
Well, Dr. Levine, it's 12 o'clock and we promised we'd let you break free right. at 12 <laughs> o'clock. And I can't thank you enough. It's just been wonderful. Uh, questions are still coming in. Um, we'll have to figure out a way to maybe get those on the website or something. I'll sure, sure. leave that up to Dova. But thank you, thank you, thank you. It was wonderful. We appreciate your time and sharing so much information. All right, thanks everybody, have a great weekend. Thank you, bye. And it looks like now we're ready to move on to our next speaker. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce Karen Burton. She's been a registered nurse and she has the infusion nurse certification. She's had that for 20 years now. She's been with um, Honor Health for 19 years and Um, she's, she's just been an amazing nurse. She's been doing my infusions every other week for about three years now. And I speak from experience when I say she's care, caring, knowledgeable, kind, and she does a great stick. I hardly ever feel it, Karen, so thank <laughs> you. Um, we're gonna turn the screen over to you. I, I wanted to say we're gonna turn the floor over to you, but we're not on stage. So I'll turn the screen over to you. We'll let you talk and then um, I'm sure questions will be pouring in. I already have a few. So Karen, it's all yours. Thank you, Joan, I appreciate it. And I appreciate you inviting me to do this today. Hopefully I can give some information that will help make um, an infusion easier for those of you, especially that have not had to have an infusion before and just give you some um, general information. One thing to remember it, that is very important that um, every infusion center and or hospital has different policies and procedures and how they do things. So what I'm uh, giving you information on is the standards that we follow. In administering IVIG, we of course follow the manufacturer's recommendations, but other um, Parts of it are left up to the physician, what he would like to have done and to the facility uh, policies. So let's start with um, you're coming for an infusion. So you walk into our infusion center. We um, do our COVID screening and um, put you in a recliner, make you comfortable. And then hopefully you've done a few things to prepare for your visit. The uh, main thing that we ask is to hydrate with water. Caffeine doesn't do it, it makes you dehydrated. So lots and lots of water the day before, the day of, and the day after. This helps with uh, helping us start your IV. It does make your veins more accessible. And then with lessening of the side effects of the um, IVIG that you may experience. We do ask our patients to take their regularly scheduled medications and to go ahead and eat normally as they would before coming in. The infusion itself can last several hours. So we want you to wear comfortable clothing so that you can be as comfortable sitting in a recliner that uh, you can be. I know our infusion center can get quite chilly sometimes. I know Joan brings her own blanket. We um, are fortunate that we have a blanket warmer so we can provide warm blankets to our patients, but um, a lot prefer to bring their own fuzzy blankets. Bringing water um, is important. If your center doesn't have that available to you, we do have uh, bottled water available for our patients. Since it can last several hours, it's important that you eat normally. So bring snacks and or something to eat and um, so that you can uh, continue um, your normal routine. Any medications that would normally be taken, we ask our patients to bring those also. So now um, you're settled into a recliner. We start an IV in an arm or a hand with a small uh, catheter, and this is left in during your um, infusion. Some patients, if they don't have good veins, um, 
have a port, which um, is implant implanted in um, your chest below your collarbone. And it can be made of plastic, stainless steel, or titanium. It depends on the manufacturer. The port's about the size of a quarter, but a little bit thicker. And then a flexible tube um, runs from that um, reservoir into the um, large vein that uh, we deliver the medication into. When, you, when we access, access a port, we put a small needle through the um, skin into the port. We use it uh, for the medication. It can be used to have blood drawn, which is very um, nice for some patients. And it also can be used to deliver the um, dyes and medications during uh, like a CT scan or an MRI. Patients can have um, surgeries and they can use the port um, instead of trying to find a vein. Then once you go home and um, you give it a few hours just to have that tiny little poke um, heal over and then there's no care that the patient has to take. Um, you can swim, you can do whatever you normally would. So now that we have our IV or our port accessed, we uh, may give some pre-medications. These are medications that the physician may order to help prevent um, any reactions to the IVIG, which that's what I'm focusing on today is the IVIG, but we give many other medications in our infusion center. Um, the medications could include Tylenol, Benadryl, which be, could be given a pill or through your IV. And sometimes the physician will order solumedrol. These medications are totally um, up to the provider, whether they routinely order them. Some patients have had reactions and they definitely get them. And other patients do well with their infusions and choose not to have any medications. So this can be a very individualized um, process. Then there are many brands of IVIG and it can depend on the facility. We usually stick to just two different brands or it can depend on the patient's um, uh, tolerance to the IVIG. Some patients have to be put on a different one because they just don't tolerate one as well as another. We follow the manufacturer's guidelines in infusing our IVIG and it is based on weight. Um, the rate is increased um, at our infusion center every 30 minutes. When we increase the rate, we do vital signs, including blood pressure and temperature. And then we keep increasing the rate until the um, maximum recommended rate is achieved. This is usually um, a maximum of eight steps. So it could take quite a while for the maximum rate to be achieved for some patients. Other patients do not tolerate and probably will never tolerate the maximum rate and may have a very slow infusion. And this is um, depending on their tolerance and, um, to their um, medication. There are, as with any medications, common side effects. Um, IVIG, the, the one that is most common is a headache. You can have back or joint pain, fever, chills, sweating, nausea, tiredness. Some patients have no energy for a day or two and then they're fine after that. If you have any questions about um, side effects or adverse effects, that's definitely something that you need to discuss with your provider and you may need to um, have a change in your pre-medications or medications that you take afterwards. Once the um, infusion is finished, the IV is removed or the needle removed from the port. And um, we recommend that if it's the first infusion that the patient have someone to 
drive them home because you never know how you're going to feel. And with the pre-medications, especially the Benadryl, that can make you kind of sleepy. Although the length of the infusions um, being a long one at sometimes, um, the Benadryl is usually worn off by then. But after the first infusion, if there are no side effects and you feel fine, then you're able to drive yourself to and from if you normally drive. If you don't normally drive, then I wouldn't recommend that. <laughs> Have somebody bringing you and picking you up. So um, one thing that um, patients don't wanna do is complain. So if, if you start feeling anything Annie. during the, <laughs> if you start feeling anything during the infusion, um, no matter how minor it might be, we ask that you tell us. It could be something that you're right, it's nothing, but then it could be something that's going to lead to it getting worse. So we like to um, be ahead of the game. If, if a patient has a reaction to the infusion minor, we may just slow the infusion. We um, may stop it for a few minutes to see what's going to happen. And then if need be, we have what we call emergency medications that we can treat um, the symptoms. I've never had a patient that has not finished their infusion or that um, we've had to um, seek further medical treatment because of their infusion. So we're very fortunate in that. And we like to be proactive and start things or stop things before they proceed and get too bad and out of control. So um, that's all I have. That's a basic overview of an infusion. I've been doing it a long time. I love it. I love my patients and we're there to um, take good care of them. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> that was amazing. Um, and since you did say you'd stay for a few questions, I do have a few. Okay. Um, so one concern is why don't my legs start shaking during an infusion? What can I do about this? We found that most of the time the shaky legs are from the Benadryl. That is a side effect of the Benadryl and um, the IV Benadryl seems to cause that more than the oral. Other patients uh, just don't take any Benadryl and they do fine. It could be a side effect, just getting used to the medication, but my experience, it's always been due to the, if we give Benadryl. Okay, great. Um, here's a good one. How long does a port last? A port can last years. I've had patients that have had a port for years. As long as there are no problems with it, there can always be um, as with anything in the body, an infection, which can be taken care of, or um, it forms a small um, fibrin sheath, we call it, over the end of it, and it doesn't allow it to infuse any longer. But as long as the port is um, flushed every four to six weeks, if it's not being used and um, maintained in that way, it should last for years. Great, thank you. Um, here's a good one. Is there anything I can take or do to ease the anxiety that I feel during an infusion? I think that um, is really a very individualized um, problem or experience. Usually once you get Benadryl, it, that helps it. Or if you're very anxious, then probably you need to talk to your provider and get something, some, a medication that you can take for that, even if it's just while you're getting the infusion. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure about this one. I'm not sure if this is for you or maybe you should have been for the doctor. Are side effects from IVIG due to the ingredients in the IVIG or from the action 
of the globulin post IV? I would think that is a provider question. I would think that it is um, just a reaction that um, a patient may have to the ingredients in the IVIG and then what it is doing. So that I really can't um, answer specifically. Thank you. Next one, uh, why would a slower rate of infusion change the side effects I experience? Because um, some patients don't tolerate um, it going in as fast. They, uh, their body doesn't accept it as much. We have patients that go four to five times faster than another patient will just because of their tolerance. A patient can be at the max uh, rate that we can infuse it, not take pre-meds and are fine. They have no side effects whatsoever. But another patient has pre-medications. Um, we run it at a slow rate. And if we try to increase the rate at all, then they end up having a headache or not feeling well the, the day after. So it's very, um, it can be very specific to each patient's tolerance. Great. Um, <clears throat> here's um, an observation, I think, um, from Deb. She says, I always had side effects from IVIG and had to keep the infusion at a slow rate. However, now they do the fluids concurrently and I have few side effects and can get up to the maximum rate. So what are your thoughts on that, Karen? Again, it goes back to the hydration. Um, we do have, have had patients um, that we have had to run um, fluids in so that they can tolerate it better. So that is not an unusual thing, but that's why we ask our patients to hydrate before the day of and the day after to help uh, prevent that from happening. Great, thank you. Um, Connie, I think we're about out of time and questions. Um, do you see any questions that I'm not seeing perhaps? You know, I maybe this one has already been answered um, and please uh, correct me. Uh, I have one from uh, Timothy and Joan Perry, Colin, that says, why would a slower rate of infusion change the side effects I experience? Okay, we just uh, we just did briefly um, okay. discuss that, and it's Thank you. very individualized. Uh, right. Thank you to each much. person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm I'm taking notes at the same time. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, we all get that overlapping thing. Okay, we, here's one that just came in. It's from uh, Thomas Larson, uh, and forgive me if I can't pronounce it, but it says Gamma Guard is in a long chain glucose solution whereas carmine is in a sucrose sugar solution. It burned my kidneys. No question, just a statement. Um, your input on that, Karen? Um, any IVIG can um, be, um, the kidneys can be affected by it. So that's again where um, the provider would need to be involved in that. Maybe there needs to be um, more hydration to keep the kidneys flushed out, but that's definitely a provider um, question if there is a question about it. Okay. Yeah, and I think Karen and I did talk about this prior to the meeting, and that's what we were concerned about is that there are some things that are only only a provider can answer. And Karen will give her perspective from her um, years of doing this and education. Um, we do have one more now. My daughter <laughs> has um, had IVIG that mistakenly infused too quickly and uh, she ended up hospitalized with meningitis. Now we know that's not actual meningitis and I'll let Karen explain that. Is there any possibility that she would tolerate it if it was infused more slowly or should it never be tried for her again? Karen, is that one for you? Um, I can't answer that. It would totally be on the patient's medical history, 
lab results. Um, yeah, that one I can't even touch. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and that's that's fine. That's, that's beyond fine. my license. <laughs> <laughs> right, and we we definitely want to respect that. Um, I think um, Connie, if you're good with it, we're going to start our little break. Let's give everyone a chance to stretch their legs, get a snack, and um, we'll see you back at. Connie, what time? I'll let you uh, we'll see everyone at the top of the hour, 12 noon. And we will start off with Dr. Ali Habib. And he will be speaking about research and clinical trials update. And um, just to let everyone know, can Connie's in California. So she's talking Pacific time. I'm in Arizona. For all of us in Arizona, that'll be 1 p.m. Just Thank to Thank you. And then <laughs> everyone else, um, you know, I know we have people in the UK and yeah, so in Asia. So we'll let you figure out your own time. <laughs> That's a great heads up. Okay, okay, everyone, enjoy your break. We'll see you at the top of the hour. Great. Thanks, everyone. Huh. <laughs> 
No, no, that's the program. of this concrete warship and what connection does it have to one of the grisliest events of the second world war <laughs>
Welcome back, everyone. Okay, everyone, I hope you had a good lunch. We'll get started in just a few. Dr. Habib, are you there? Okay, Dr. Habib, I will be with you in just one second. I'm waiting for you to unmute. There you are. <laughs> you heard me. <laughs> Sorry, I tried to escape just at the last minute. Okay, uh, unmute yourself, please. Can you hear me? Um, no. Let me see if I can manage to help unmute. Dova? We can we can hear if you. You're Dr. still Habib. there. Would you please unmute yes. Dr. We Habib? Hear, we can hear him, Connie. Oh, Connie, is your volume up? Yeah. Okay. I still cannot hear you. One moment. Okay, Connie. Can oh, let me text her. Okay, Dr. Habib, you can go ahead. And okay. I, there we go. I will talk to Connie. There we go. Are you good? I'm can good. You hear me now? Yes, I can. Thank you so much for joining us. All I have the great pleasure of introducing Dr. Habib. He is an associate professor, professor, University of California in Irvine. In addition to that, I have the honor of having him as my boyfriend's neurologist. My boyfriend's name is Paul Driscoll. Thank you, sir. And with that, I noticed that Dr. Habib has included in the chat to everybody a live polling activity that he will be managing during the presentation. He's included the link and it appears that you'll probably have to cut and paste it, but I'll have him explain it. And with that said, Dr. Habib, I turn the presentation over to you. Awesome. Thank you, Connie, uh, for having me <clears throat> present uh, on, at this uh, thing. It typically, uh, this would have been a much smaller crowd, uh, but thanks to COVID, uh, a much larger audience, and hopefully uh, I have some useful information to share for all of you. Um, I have the privilege of uh, help working with many uh, patients with myasthenia gravis at University of California, Irvine. Um, I have learned a ton from my patients and from all the people that I work with. Uh, and the things that I get right on this presentation, the credit of that goes to my patients and to the wonderful colleagues that I learn from every day uh, at the University of California, Irvine, my colleagues in neuromuscular medicine. Any errors that you may find, I take full responsibility for, responsibility for that. Those are on me. Um, with that, I'm going to get going here. If I can figure out how to move my slides, there we go. All right, so just in terms of introduction, um, I'm going to cover a few things here. So hopefully, uh, I got my um, stuff right and the live poll works. And hopefully, if it works, uh, you guys will have some fun with it. Um, I'm just going to cover very, very briefly some of the things that we deal with in myasthenia pathophysiology and how that uh, understanding that has led to the advances and successes in the care of myasthenia gravis. So without further ado, here is the first question for you. Um, and if you guys are able to log into the poll, just go ahead and select your response and I'll give it a few seconds to see if it works. Ah, and here we go. We have some responses coming in. And oh, that's no fun. Um, you guys aren't able to see the responses. Um, I will assure you guys that I got responses here on my screen. Oh, shoot, I wish I knew how to share this. Um, 
Apologies for that. I'm going to move on. Uh, we tried. We did. Well, it does work on my end. I am seeing the results populate in my screen, but it would have been most fun if you guys were able to see it. Nice. Um, so I guess I will keep all that information to myself. Um, but thank you all for participating and don't give up on that one yet. Um, so just briefly touching about the pathophysiology and the mechanisms involved in myasthenia, because all of this has a role to play in on how we've gotten to this point in terms of the treatment and management in myasthenia. So it, as some of this may be very familiar to you guys, um, you know, the B cells are a type of white blood cells in our body that are one arm of our defense mechanism against all kinds of things. Uh, including things like infection and tumor and all that stuff. So the B cells come from the bone um, and are constantly being produced there. And when they see a, uh, in a foreign material, which in fancy words is referred to as the antigen that stimulates them to produce defense mechanisms against that antigen. And in the case of myasthenia, they go into the thymus and there the big production takes place. And that's why there is a role for thymectomy in myasthenia. And we'll talk a bit more about that um, later on. And then these cells produce the antibodies that are, as um, uh, Dr. Levine mentioned, with a, he's covered a lot of the ground that I'm gonna cover so it makes my life easy. Uh, but they produce antibodies and these antibodies result in myasthenia. And the, fortunately in myasthenia, the, the pathology and the mechanisms are very well understood and that really facilitates the treatment um, in myasthenia. So these produce antibodies, the antibodies have various actions at the neuromuscular junction excuse me, which is the main area of communication between nerve and muscle. And these antibodies primarily what they do is affect the communication on the muscle membrane. So it's not much of a nerve related issue, but it destroys in various ways the receptor which is responsible for signaling from the nerve and thereby reduces the muscle's activity uh, causing weakness. So on that note, uh, again, uh, apologize, you were not able to see this poll, but here's um, another question uh, for the audience. How well do you know your myasthenia? Do you know which antibody uh, you guys have? And I have again, responses coming in and uh, I don't know the exact numbers of people, but uh, yeah, I got an X on the acetylcholine receptor up on the screen. That's, that's pretty cool. Um, uh, right now, 57% people are reporting that they have the acetylcholine receptor antibody, which is not a surprise. Um, interestingly, I don't have any musk patients. Oh, the number for acetylcholine receptor just went up to close to 70%. Um, and I have a fair number of patients with uh, no antibodies, the so-called seronegative group, 22%. All right, um, moving to the next slide. So this is uh, how the treatment paradigm and armamentarium for myasthenia looked up until just the last handful of years. So as uh, Dr. Levine had mentioned, really the cornerstone of myasthenia management has been prednisone and pyridostigmine. Um, we are not huge fans of pyridostigmine because if, of all the medications that are used in the management of myasthenia, this is the only medication that does not alter or control that immune attack on the neuromuscular junction. It is still a very effective medication. It really does provide symptom relief to, uh, to patients and to people who use it, not universally, but to a large number of people. Um, and so it is an effective management strategy, but it doesn't really impact uh, the underlying mechanism in myasthenia gravis. Thymectomy is a one-time deal. Um, it has been um, in practice uh, for almost a century at this point. Um, and 
uh, as I'll talk in a bit, really the clear definitive role for thymectomy only became uh, confirmed uh, just in 2016 when the real pivotal study uh, that took a tremendous amount of effort from the entire MG community uh, got published. Um, in terms of um, therapies for really preventing or rescuing uh, patients from exacerbations, we tend to rely on IVIG and plasma exchange. And then when people are on steroids, you use the steroid sparing medications, depending on various factors. And all of us have one or two favorites in this list of medications that are our go-to medications. Um, and I'm sure all of you have had some experience with uh, at least one of these therapies. And then there are all these newbies that are coming up um, on the horizon that, um, that we're gonna talk about in a bit. So really, uh, again, uh, Dr. Levine had talked about this. Uh, the community has done a phenomenal job of really eliminating the word gravis from the uh, vernacular for myasthenia. And the, as he had mentioned, the, it, it was associated with a really high mortality before any therapies became available. And the, the therapy that had the most impact on improving that survival really was actually critical care, uh, intensive care, um, not so much any of the treatments that we use because the norm for myasthenia, and this was described even in the very, very early days of myasthenia, was that if patients survived the um, myasthenic crisis, they would have spontaneous recovery. But at this point, um, uh, if we were doing our job well, then really no patients so should uh, succumb to myasthenia gravis um, from crisis. That said, how many uh, on, in this audience have actually experienced a myasthenic crisis? And the myasthenic crisis is a very specific definition, which is you know, when you've had swallowing or breathing trouble to the extent that you or, and your providers are concerned that this will compromise your breathing admit you to a hospital for very close monitoring in an intensive care unit uh, with or without uh, respiratory support from a ventilator, hopefully just with a BiPAP. And I have uh, numbers rolling in and about 40% of the people, who what 30% now, who have responded uh, say that they have experienced a crisis. And again, we have one uh, notation on the screen saying uh, loud red, no. All right, so uh, getting into thymectomy, uh, again, this uh, study by Dr. Wolf was a monumental effort it, 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 on so many different levels. And in so many ways, it has really been a phenomenal outcome. So to be specific, this was talking about patients without a thymoma. When, when any myasthenic has a thymoma, which is a discrete enlargement or tumor in the thymus seen on a CT scan, there really isn't much of a debate that has to come up. Um, this was talking about patients who don't have a thymoma. Do you do a thymectomy in those patients? And the results uh, were, were very definitive. Um, thymectomy, uh, up until a certain age uh, has a very strong role in the management of myasthenia. Now, these pa the patients that were enrolled in this study were all within five years of their um, disease onset. So they were relatively early, not patients who had had myasthenia for 20 years. Um, and it made a difference in their function at the end of the study, at uh, the time point it made a difference in the prednisone dose. So there was a significant reduction in the dose of prednisone required by these patients. It made a difference in the number of exacerbations. So undergoing thymectomy, patients who had thymectomy and were on prednisone had a lower risk of having a myasthenia crisis or myasthenia exacerbation, getting admitted to the hospital. And they had a lower oh requirement for getting on steroid sparing therapies like azathioprine. 
So it, it was a really a tremendous study um, that was done. And this was only as recently as 2016. Um, so, and in, in all fairness, we've, we've been slow to adopt the results from this study in practice in the last five years, but hopefully those, the numbers are improving in terms of consideration or at least a conversation regarding thymectomy. Um, another major study uh, just a year or so later was um, the study on ecolizumab. And, and here we really see a transition in clinical trials. And this study, the Regan study, set the tone for the current, uh, subsequent trials in many different ways. One of the most important of which was that it moved the focus from studying prednisone effects. So are the treatment that we are trying is it beneficial in terms of reducing prednisone dose? It moved the focus from there to what was the patient reported outcome? So PRO is a real buzzword, patient reported outcome in clinical trials in myasthenia at this point. And the myasthenia gravis activity of daily living, which I'm sure most of you are very familiar with, was the primary outcome uh, that people were looking at in this study. And it, it was a very uh, strong result in this study. So what this graph here is showing, uh, hopefully you guys can see the mark cursor here, um, is that uh, people who were on placebo during the randomized part of the study had some drop, but the drop in those who were on echolizumab was sick, considerably more statistically significant meaning there was a clear statistical difference between them, as well as clinically meaningful, um, meaning that there was at least a two point difference compared to placebo um, um, in these studies. And even across other scales that we very frequently use, the quantitative myasthenia gravis score, which is a, a, a scale that is administered by the providers, the, the MG quality of life score, which is purely, again, a patient reported outcome. And the MG composite, which takes components from different scales and puts them together. So in, across all of them, there was a difference in the people who got echolizumab. So why, is, so switching gears and going into more of the clinical trials in myasthenia, why is there clinical interest in trials? Uh, what, how has the landscape changed and what are the current trials? So again, really the focus has gone from just preserving life to preserving living, to really improving function in patients with myasthenia. The, the government regulatory agencies are very interested in patient reported outcomes. They really have been emphasizing to uh, the industry and clinicians that these trials should be centered across, around patient reported outcome measures, which is really, which is really a very positive shift. And again, the, the research community as well as uh, the patient community has very much uh, been in favor of this change and adopted this change. The reason, uh, I mean, there are some good reasons for industry be, to be interested in myasthenia um, uh, trials, uh, there are several of them. One, the pathophysiology, like I mentioned, is very well understood. So the targets are very well delineated. And these um, drugs that are in development are targeting these uh, different aspects of myasthenia pathophysiology. Um, another key consideration is that myasthenia is still a rare disease. And there are different rules that are applied for uh, trials for rare diseases compared to those for common diseases like hypertension and diabetes and dementia. Uh, in rare diseases, the government regulatory agencies, they realize and acknowledge the fact that it's very difficult to do clinical trials in these. So you really have um, easier requirements in a sense 
in terms of what's needed to prove that a therapy is one, effective, and two, safe in these conditions. Um, how has the landscape changed over time? Uh, and, and this again is a recent time frame. So one way is that the time frames of these clinical trials has significantly changed. So whereas previously, when you take even the thymectomy study, the, the primary time point at which the analysis was done was at three years from when a patient started in the study. So it was a very long time frame. Now most of the trials are in the three to six month time frame for from when a patient enters the study to when the patient when that randomized control period is uh, ending. Uh, as I mentioned, the primary outcomes in clinical trials, the focus has changed from steroid sparing effect to an effect on the quality of life, on the activities of daily living, on the myasthenia gravis, uh, on the quantitative myasthenia gravis scale. So these scales have become the primary points that are being assessed in these studies. And fortunately for all of us involved in clinical trials, meaning uh, both the clinicians as well as patients, a major change in the trial design has been that most myasthenia trials, in fact, almost all the trials right now have a two-part design such that, you know, patient, so, uh, yeah, so that in the first part, uh, patients may be in the randomized uh, time um, part where there is a chance that you have the actual medication and there is a chance that you get placebo. Um, and in the second part, any everybody who is in the trial is definitely getting the actual treatment. So it becomes a matter of time before you see the actual trial. Now, I do want to emphasize Placebo-controlled trials are absolutely the gold standard. We can't get meaningful data from trial designs outside of a placebo control in the vast majority of instances. So as much as we would like all patients to be on this in order to really control or eliminate person bias, we have to do randomized trials. Um, and again, this, I, I like cars, and this really is pointing to how the field has sped up in myasthenia clinical trials. So I did a similar presentation in October 2018 uh, in person in Costa Mesa. And at that time, the, there were about seven active clinical trials uh, in myasthenia. Just over two years later, and now we're almost 50% up on that. So there are 11 clinical trials. And not only that, but we've branched out into more novel areas such as the CAR T cell therapies that uh, are going on. And, and this list is actually longer than even 11 studies because we are, we are aware of other studies that are in the works, uh, but they're not, um, uh, that information is not available publicly, so it's not possible to discuss those. So just going into some of the different areas in which my, the trials, the targeting therapy is happening. So again, the role of complement, um, eclizumab is the first drug in, uh, that was, has already been approved for this. And eclizumab really is the first drug approved specifically for the treatment of myasthenia. Uh, other than uh, peridostigmine. And the story with complement is that complements are proteins that are involved in the cascade of inflammation uh, and defense. Um, and complement proteins are activated by specific types of antibodies. And these specific types of antibodies are basically the Ig. The Ig stands for immunoglobulin. So that's just a fancy word for antibody. The capital G next to it over here stands for the subtype G. And even within G, there are several 